Welcome to VivaTech. If you've just joined us here at VivaTech in Paris, I'm Nadia Sharbi, and I'm going to be your host for the next three days. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm delighted to introduce the second session of our morning on this deep tech theme, entitled Space Race 2.0, the push for global broadband access. It's a chance for two eminent experts to discuss the ways in which Satellite technology is bridging the digital device and transform connectivity here on Earth. So please welcome to stage our two guests. Julie Zola is head of global regulatory affairs for Project Kaipo at Amazon. And Stephen Rogers is SVP and chief commercial officer at Ariane Space. Let's welcome them. for being with us, both of you. For those of you just joining us in the room, I think I should give your names once more. Julie Zoller, Head of Global Regulatory Affairs for Project Kaipur at Amazon, and Stephen Rogers, SVP and Chief Commercial Officer at Ariane Space. Thank you again for being with us today. Now, to give our audience a bit of context, Ariane Space and Project Kuiper are both part of the emerging uh, technology of LEO satellite broadband. Last year, they signed the largest ever commercial rocket deal, so, can I start by asking you perhaps, what's your current state of play? What type of progress are you making for your separate but connected uh, initiatives? Julie, do you want to start us off? Thank you, Nadia. It's just a delight to be here with you and to be here with Stephen today at VivaTech. Um, so, Project Kuiper is Amazon's global broadband LEO system, low Earth orbiting satellite constellation. It consists of over 3,200 satellites in low Earth orbit, plus innovative customer terminals and an extensive ground segment. We are delighted to have a partnership with Arion Space because as you can imagine, launching 3,200 satellites is quite an endeavor. And so we announced that in April of 2022. Since that announcement, um, there's been quite a, an innovation surge across Europe in 13 countries, uh, industries related to our launch contract have blossomed in Italy and in Sweden where we have our dispensers that we're making for Project Kuiper. As far as Project Kuiper goes, when I first started in three years ago, we had fewer than 100 people on the project. Today, it's over 1,400. We announced in March our innovative customer terminals, which you can see at our booth here. And we also shipped our first two protoflight satellites to, to Cape Canaveral. So we're making fabulous project progress. I've never seen anything like it in the industry. Some incredible milestones there. Stephen, how about yourself? Bonjour à tous. Uh, bonjour, Nadia. Bonjour. Thank you, Julie. Um, it's an honor to be here with you. We uh, are deeply honored that we signed an agreement on April 5th, 2022, with Kuiper, with Amazon, to provide 18 launches. And our job at Arian Space is to help our customers reach their orbit. And the way that we do that is through using enormous rockets. And we launch them from French Guiana at the European launch facility that has been there for over 40 years. And it is an extremely proud uh, accomplishment for Arian Space, but for the 600 companies all across Europe, as you mentioned, 13 countries contribute to this rocket, this Ariane 6 rocket. And thousands and thousands and thousands of people all over Europe have been working for years to get ready for this. And so Ariane Space has been launching such rockets for over 40 years. 
And Amazon chose us because partly this experience, partly because we've designed this new Ariane 6 rocket. And I'm going to give you an idea. The African male elephant weighs about 6,000 kilograms. This rocket can lift up more than three African elephants from a standing still position to 10,000 kilometers an hour within two minutes, 28,000 kilometers an hour in about eight to nine minutes. And we can talk a little bit more about how this technology is uh, perfect to help a constellation like Kuiper get into the right orbit. Those elephants won't know what's hit them. Um, and as the uh, LEO satellite space industry is quickly innovating, that's also ushering in more operators um, and more guidelines. So are these factors making space safety harder to achieve, perhaps? And are there specific efforts that you're pursuing around space safety and sustainability for the responsible use of space? That's an essential question, isn't it? Steve, do you want to start us off? No, absolutely. It's a very important question. The safety of space is a concern for all of us here in the room. Um, maybe some of you have heard of the Kessler effect, which is something that we need to avoid at all costs. The Kessler effect is when there is a collision of debris which cascades and becomes a chain reaction, which ultimately would not allow us to operate in space anymore. So imagine in low Earth orbit, you have pieces of debris which are traveling at 25,000 kilometers an hour, it really destroys other pieces of communication equipment, for example, that might be there. So what are some of the things that we do at Ariane Space in order to prevent that? I spoke a little bit about the new Ariane 6 launcher. We have a reignitable upper stage that allows us, first of all, to position the satellite in multiple orbital planes. So it reignites, puts different plane, different satellites, and then we use the third reignition to deorbit the upper stage so that we don't leave any debris. Ariane Space was also one of the first signatories during the Paris Peace Accord in 2021 to uh, promote net zero in space, and we continue to work with our partners to ensure that uh, European access to space is guaranteed and that we reduce uh, debris as much as possible. In fact, there's a very cool mission for uh, which we're going to be doing in 26 with a company called ClearSpace, whereby we literally launch a grabber, whereby we're going to grab a 100 kilo piece of debris in orbit and then deorbit it. And um, so it's the first time that that's going to be done. So it's very exciting. And we're very proud of working with Amazon and Kuiper because they're taking some very serious steps to mitigate exactly the same things. Tell us about that. Thank you. Space sustainability has been a core tenant for the Kuiper project from day one. Our mission depends on having a healthy space environment now and into the future. And so when we chose our orbital altitudes, when we designed our satellites, and when we determined how we were going to operate them, it was all with space safety in mind. We chose orbital altitudes where we can deorbit our satellites at the end of mission life in less than one year. And we put propulsion systems on our satellites so that we could avoid debris that's in space, safely navigate during our mission life, and then bring our satellites down. We're committed to sharing our location information with other operators and to sharing how we're going to maneuver our satellites so that everyone knows where we're going and when. We think that's essential to ensuring the long-term sustainability of safe of space. And in terms of sustainability, it's, it's an Amazon core commitment. We started the 2019 
uh, climate pledge to get to net zero carbon emissions across our company by, by 2040, 10 years before the uh, UN commitment. And Kuiper is part of that. And we're busy working on reducing um, our carbon impact of Project Kuiper as part of Amazon's overall commitment. Fascinating stuff. Now, the emergence of uh, satellite broadband is also changing the pace and uh, reliability of connection throughout the world um, to help close the digital divide. So where do you each see the greatest need and or impact for this growing capability and technology? Do you want to start us off, Julie? Connectivity is missing across the globe. There are unserved and underserved communities in developed and developing countries alike. The scale at which Amazon operates, we feel a commitment to helping to solve big problems on behalf of customers. And so when we looked at the, the lack of broadband that communities were experiencing and the impacts that has on education, employment opportunities, the ability to access government services and so on, we decided it was time for us to do something about it. And that's the, the genesis of Project Kuiper, providing broadband services to people across the globe is good for society and it's good for business. We feel we're uniquely capable of delivering low-cost consumer devices. And so we put a lot of innovation into our customer terminals that will be delivered with Project Kuiper services. Stephen, what's your take on the impact of increased connectivity? During the past two decades, I've been working for communication satellite companies all over the world. And the most dangerous job in the world is to be a fisherman. And um, very often, they don't have any communications. They don't have any SOS button. They don't have a bank account. They don't have an insurance policy. And so being able to have a connection, inform your family that you're going to be home in two days instead of tomorrow makes a huge difference. I don't know about you, how you feel when you don't have connectivity to, with the internet, but it, I feel it. I spoke to a friend yesterday who was in Bangalore. He didn't have internet connectivity for eight hours. He was going nuts. <laughs> and um, we take connectivity for granted. But even in the home of Silicon Valley, in California, 80% of the utility network, the electricity network, is connected. The rest is not. And the only way that you can connect those locations is satellite, because it just doesn't make economic sense to deploy cellular technologies. So there's a huge opportunity for growth, whether it's schools or government services, whether it's on ships, whether it's in aviation, there's a lot of opportunity there. And so the digital divide is real, and we have a lot of work to do. Wonderful. We have time for one last question. Um, since the Leo industry is growing as a whole, what does hiring and the current work workforce actually uh, look like now? Are you finding the talent pool deep enough to hire the people you need as, as quickly as you need? <laughs> we are always looking for great people. If there's an engineer, if there is someone here who is a great marketeer, recruitment at arianespace.com. Please, feel free. Many people think that it's only engineers that can apply that have very specific physics or mathematics degrees. We need those people too. But there's a whole range of skills and people that we're looking for. That's number one. Number two is the people that work for Arian Space and the companies that we work with, they do this because there is a deep passion for what we do. There is a real love in the mission 
for helping our customers using amazing technology to get to space. So for example, we launched the James Webb Telescope, which you may know, if you haven't seen it, go look at the pictures, it's just iconic. And why would a NASA um, mission launch with a European rocket? It's because of this unbelievable reliability and performance that we've shown again and again. So what happens is, young people, they might not know who we are, but they find out about the James Webb Telescope. They see how by injecting that telescope precisely, we double the life of the telescope. That's really worthwhile, and then they contact us. But please, do reach out. We need you. A clear call to action there. Julie? We've assembled a world-class group of scientists and engineers to build Kuiper. And I can't emphasize enough the need for our science, technology, engineering, and math pipeline to grow so that we have the talent that we need to work on projects like Kuiper. I'm on a committee in the United States for the Federal Aviation Administration, and the first task that they gave us this year was to help the FAA and the, and the space industry increase the STEM pipeline and do so in a way that is diverse and inclusive. And so we're working on that. We're working on that with uh, the White House Space Council and we're, we're helping programs that not only encourage kids and young adults to go into engineering and science as a career field, but also technicians. Uh, we're all in need of technicians that, to perform jobs that don't require degrees, but do require that technical acumen. And as Stephen mentioned, there's such a passion for space missions, and there is such a passion for connectivity. And is that a, a reason also to upskill the, task, the workforce you already have? Yes, we do have programs for helping bring employees from one level of skill set or one type of skill up into a, a completely new career field. Amazing. Thank you very much. We're going to have to leave it at that, unfortunately. We're running out of time. But thank you both, uh, Julie Zeller and Stephen Rutgers, for having been with us on such a, an inspiring uh, and uh, insightful conversation. Thank you both. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you. And with that, it's time to take a short break. We'll be back in just a few minutes for our next double session on health tech. The first is entitled Future Living Ethics and Opportunities of Biohacking. So if you can, stay with us. Thank you.